Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, January 8th, 2008 school board meeting. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Um, adjustments to the agenda, Alan? Uh, yes, I have a couple of, uh, one is a mistake. Uh, I, I think I caused this with my new secretary. So if you go into number eight where it says school report, just cross those all out. Uh, we are not doing a school report tonight, so they'll just take those all out at this point in time. Uh, also, I do have, I'm trying to get this so we have all the material on time, but unfortunately, the vacation kind of threw our schedule up. So I do have two, uh, athletic uh, positions. One is just a change in money and one is just a, uh, a nomination. And I would also say to you that under uh, communications A, notification of retirement for a middle school staff member, cancel that because that person is not going to retire after all, which pleases me to no end, so we go from there. And the other change, Alan, where, where do we put that? Uh, these these uh, two, the athletic positions, yes. would go under new business. You could put it as E. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, is there a motion for the approval of the December 11th school board minutes? So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Jack. Any discussion or changes or omissions? All in favor? Seven? Zero. I'm getting used to not having Mary here. It's a little hard. Um, comments by student reps. Um, Hudson is not able to make it this evening, but Kirsten is here. Yeah. Um, Friday, next Friday, is the beginning of our midterms, and we'll, that'll continue on after Martin Luther King Day, which will conclude the end of the quarter and the end of the semester. And then we have a school dance coming up in a couple of weeks. And other than a lot of learning, not all that's going on in the school. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> Comments or questions for Kirsten? And are Piper or Michaela here this evening? Saying no. No, okay. Great, thank you. Um, are there any comments from the public on non-agenda items? No, okay. Communication, Alan, a uh, letter of resignation from a high school staff member. Okay, uh, I have a letter that is dated December 21st, 2007 to, to me. Uh, it is from Rachel Guthrie, who is the Cape Elizabeth High School technology person. And she writes that regretfully, this letter serves to notify you that as of January 13th, it is my intent to move from Cape Elizabeth High School. Although I say this uh, every time I leave a job, this one has really been my favorite so far. The community has been engaging and supportive, and I have been allowed a great deal of personal and academic growth. Last year, before I had been given a full-time teaching position at Cape Elizabeth High School, I sent out several applications. One of those potential employers, uh, some of the main community college, called me a few weeks ago, and we began to talk. It turns out that this community college is able to offer many things that fit my current set of needs, including help with my son's college tuition. It makes me sad to say goodbye, but I'm also very excited for the future, and I look forward to seeing many of my former students and classes uh, this coming semester. Kathy, may I comment? Yes. I just want to comment that this one in particular for me, I'm very, very sad. I'm always sad when anybody resigns, but um, she'll be greatly missed, I know, at the high school and has done a wonderful job with the music club and especially with the digital lab, and we've got some incredible equipment there. So I'm hopeful and optimistic that we'll be able to find somebody to replace her, especially in that role, because I know what a tremendously positive impact she's had on many students at the high school. Thank you. All set? Um, Do you need a motion? No, you don't. No. You're all right. yeah. no, we don't have the power. Yeah. Um, recognition, the Madden School dedication. Steve? As you'll recall, last year we uh, 
it was authorized by the school board to dedicate a room at the middle school as the Rick Madden um, conference room. And that's the, uh, what they used to call the small conference room that's off the library. Um, we had the dedication for that today. If you get a chance to stop by and check that out, you'll see. If you've seen it previously, it's uh, very colorful. The MSPA uh, parents came in, painted the room, um, cleaned up a lot of the, uh, I think everything's been done in there from cleaning out the, the light fixtures, replacing some ceiling tiles, uh, putting up curtains, putting cushions on seat, seats, the wooden seats in there. Um, so the room looks very nice. There's a, there's a uh, large picture of Rick there um, with uh, an explanation of why the room is dedicated to him. So we, today at 11 o'clock, we had uh, like an opening ceremony for that room, the, the dedication, ribbon cutting. And it was, I think we had probably 30 people in that space at that time, which is a pretty good number for that space. Um, students will be going through that room in the next, uh, either some went through today, some will be going through tomorrow and some the day after. And we have a very, very large trifold card that if you'd like to stop by and sign, that will be in the main office this week. Um, <clears throat> Rick was the, that's where Rick met with his advisees, and he was the cornerstone of the middle school advisory program. That's, how, that's the biggest vehicle that he would say to us, we're a middle school, don't forget that. This isn't all about grades, this isn't all about ath athletics and so forth. We're a middle school and you need advisory programs. We've got to look after the social, um, social emotional well-being of the students. So he was the main champion of that idea and saw the advisory as a crucial component to that. So we felt that it was very fitting to dedicate that room to Rick. So it was a nice turnout. Uh, MSPA also, under the direction of Grace Ott, uh, provided uh, food for students and staff today. Very nice day. Uh, Julie Salikas, very nice event. Julie Salikas, the school nurse, uh, had some uh, recollections of uh, situations with Rick, as did um, Hayden Atwood and myself. So, good turnout, good day. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. Anybody want to make any additional comments? Steve, don't sit down. We have yeah. the next one for you, too. Trish, did you want to? Steve, um, middle school visit by, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, middle school visit by town council school board on January 18th. January 18th. We have uh, at our Thursday, this, this week at our Thursday um, team leader meeting, we'll be putting together a schedule, kind of like a menu, to be able to say to school board members and town council members that here's all the different things going on in classrooms across the school. Um, select from the menu what you'd like to see. For instance, I was talking with... Andy Strout and Sarah Kinsella, and they both said, want to see what our fitness program looks like right now? And match that up with the technology piece, the, the online component where the students are entering their physical fitness challenge data. Um, and you can go from that to, uh, it could be uh, looking at how students are writing up lab reports for an eighth grade science class. So there's going to be a whole host of activities. And school board members, town council members are welcome to uh, come in and spend the day with us. We'll even treat you to lunch in the cafeteria. No, no remarks on that? All right. So, <laughs> 5210. Come on. Uh, so we'll treat you to lunch. And uh, if you can only make part of the day, feel free to stop into the office. The schedule will be there. Pick from the items that you'd like to see. Steve, will you be able to send maybe a copy of that schedule? I will. In advance. That would be great. So I'll hope to do that maybe Monday. Then people can sort of pick and choose because yeah. I know some people have different schedules and, and I know they want to come, but they want to sort of pick and choose where they can come. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I, I would also follow up with that is that this is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, Tom started it two years ago or last year? Last year. Last year. At uh, Pond Cove, it was a wonderful opportunity for school board members and uh, uh, town council members to come and see what goes on in the schools. And so this is the next phase of it, moving to the middle school and doing that same type of thing and give people an opportunity to see what really does happen in our schools. It's a very active place. I wonder what the next phase would be. Yeah, <laughs> Jeff is very intrigued in his paperwork. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not paying attention at all. <laughs> okay. Questions? Okay. Thank you, Steve. Uh, next item is the meeting with the town council, which took place last night. And the school board and the town council got together and we talked about a, a 
a group of uh, issues, and I'll just briefly go over those. Um, we talked about the new cons school consolidation law as it relates to the budget process, and Alan uh, discussed that, but he's going to be discussing that later, so I won't um, do that now. Um, the status of the Cape Elizabeth traffic light, um, it was blinking yesterday, and today at about 1 o'clock, it seemed to be fully functional. Uh, and I know that Mike McGovern asked that people be um, um, patient as they adjust it to um, address the incoming and outgoing of the high school. Um, the status of Jordan Way access to school grounds, uh, they are trying, I know Jordan Way is currently open from 7 a.m. to 7.30 a.m. for incoming to the high school, but not outgoing, and they are looking at closing that. I'm not sure. Right after Martin Luther King's birthday, so oh. the Tuesday after that. Thank you. Uh, the status, status of the Hannaford Field Committee recommendations regarding bleachers, which we will hear about in a little bit, and the general update on the bond approval last year to be issued in the spring of 2008, and Mike McGovern and I went over that. Um, that there is a bond proposed as of last year's budget, and it is still on target to be it's It's been approved, and um, it may or may not be adjusted uh, based on the uh, Hannaford Field Committee recommendations and the school board's approval. Yeah. And it does have to be approved in order to go out and get the financing for it. Right. <coughs> um, and that about covered, and we had a nice uh, dinner, a little bit of pizza and a little bit of uh, salad. And we enjoyed ourselves, and we were all there, so it was nice. The next um, item is the fifth grade team Japan week, and I understand we have Kathy Walsh here to um, update us on that, so we appreciate her time. Thank you for having me. Um, I was a little surprised when I saw on the agenda that the fifth grade was going to be recognized and I went, oh my goodness, um, a couple of words isn't really enough. <laughs> so here I have a few more. Um, I thought that you would appreciate knowing how our fifth grade integrated unit came about. Um, last spring, with Alan's um, approval, Marguerite uh, Rona Lawler, uh, Sally Conley, and I had the opportunity to participate in one of the most uh, marvelous professional development opportunities that any of us has had, <laughs> had the chance to be a part of. Um, it's called Views of the East. It's conducted at Bowdoin College and it's funded by the Freeman Foundation and the five colleges out in Western Massachusetts. So we went to um, Bowdoin for a, a long weekend in the spring and then we spent five days there this at the beginning of the summer. Uh, as a result, it's our responsibility to bring the information that we learned back to our children and we immediately thought about creating an integrated unit for the fifth grade. Uh, integrated units are things that we've done in the past. Um, we've done Peru. Last year, uh, Susie and Janelle had done some professional development with Arcadia, and the children were in the French cycle, and so we went about creating an opportunity for the kids to learn more about the Arcadians and uh, the work that, the events that happened during their period of life. And again, we had that just before the winter break uh, in December a year ago. So we decided um, our energy was very, very high after coming off this development and we knew that we wanted to study Japan because all fifth grade students, 90%, read the story um, The Big Wave. It was a perfect jumping point for this uh, particular unit of study, immediately tied in. It wasn't creating something new, it was enhancing something that already existed in our curriculum. I wanted to be sure um, that I added, as a result of our participation in the program with the Views of the East, each of us was given $300 for a total of $900 for books and uh, media for our library. And I mean, that's really marvelous. We got to take advantage of their suggestions. And so now the middle school library is $900 richer uh, in terms of curriculum materials. So um, the way we worked this out, Marguerite started right off the bat and wrote a PTA grant, uh, MSPA, excuse me, um, for $1,200, which they immediately approved. Of course, Steve approved the opportunity to do it. Um, and she had a friend in uh, Portland by the name of Yaiko. She's a Japanese artist. And she came on board and worked with our children during the week. Um, she took up residence in the 
large conference room and all of the fifth graders had the opportunity to paint with ink on rice paper and just this week um, one of my children I was saying you've got to clean out that desk and this child took these papers and said Mrs. Walsh these are really precious I have to take good care of them and I was just so touched so right you know that was just marvelous okay so shortly after um, Marguerite got her grant Sally Conley um, wrote a grant to SEIF and the three of us went off to SEIF and that grant was to support guest speakers and additional materials fortunately they also thanks to our board members as well, they uh, granted us that money. I might add, we're going to probably return a couple hundred dollars to see if, because we didn't use all of the money that they had planned. Um, we began the week, um, so it's important for you to understand that the team agrees to suspend everyday um, schedule. So for that week, just before the holiday, for the four days, Monday through Thursday, the children do not have their typical science, math, social studies program. And the, one of the most important things for them is it's really a no homework week. So we've got them right then. I mean, you don't have homework. You have to be good. You have to pay attention. But they're really thrilled that for that week there isn't any homework. But you can also imagine that it's a hard week to get children to focus. And so this is an opportunity to give them a new experience that they're very, very animated and excited about. So we began the week with a movie called The Natural Treasures of Japan, which is a movie that we had seen up at Bowdoin. They were fabulous. The children were marvelous. Then um, they had the opportunity to attend 11 different classes. So Marguerite uh, made tea bowls with every child. Uh, Yaiko did the painting. They did haiku. They did math games. They had three opportunities to use technology. Uh, with Mrs. Joyce, you know, we pull in the special ed piece of it, Mr. Whaley, Mr. Killips, the world language teachers do a presentation for the children. So every aspect of their day, or what they normally have in a week, is transferred to a different setting, but tied with a similar theme. Um, Margaret Welch used um, some of the, she's a, been a Fulbright teacher in Japan, so she used um, slides and tapes of what she, her experience in Japan. The money that we got from the um, SEIF grant, um, this is another way that this permeated the community. Uh, we had gotten in touch with Gail Schmader, like how can the community support us? And this is a great story. This fellow by the name of Dr. Um, Dr. David Weiss, I believe, I apologize if that's not accurate. Um, he is a, a fellow who lives here in town, and three times he saw the runner come across the channel, um, the Cape Elizabeth channel. Cape Elizabeth fifth grade is looking for Japanese interest. Well, the first time he ignored it. The second time he thought, well, this is really weird. The third time he said, I have to act on this. Well, he takes lessons from a master Japanese flautist by the name of Phil James. He's one of the very few master flautists in the country. And he said, you know, I've seen this three times. I've got to do something with it. He contacted Gail. He contacted me through Gail. We had great conversations. And through his kindness of paying attention, we were able to bring this fellow by the name of uh, Phil James to teach all of the children, demonstrate how he uses his flout, and he was unbelievable with fifth graders. He had them in the palm of his hand, and he brought antique uh, flutes made of bamboo. Uh, it was just fabulous. So that was one of our guest speakers. Another guest speaker was one of our students, Rachel Muscat, who's a junior, who um, her mom saw something through the volunteer thing, and she said, Rachel's got to do this. Well, one thing led to another. Rachel came in and spoke to 150 fifth graders about a summer that she had spent in Japan. She spent five or six weeks during the summer of 2006 and spoke to the children and told them things like about the bathroom and like things I never would have said. But, you know, when you're 18 or 19, <laughs> she knew the kinds of things that they'd be interested in, and they were just incredible. Um, <laughs> Then another um, guest speaker that we had, um, Matt Whaley, one of our teachers, um, his children attend the uh, Dragon Fire Martial Arts uh, Center over in Scarborough. And he asked the sensei there if he would be willing to come and do a demonstration. So he brought his um, students, eight children, who were absolutely unbelievable. They demonstrated their strength, their self-control, and their talent. Our children were mesmerized by their presentation. They just sat there like completely awed. 
by the talent, the self-control, um, the organization, the attention that these, I think there were about eight children who came. So that was a, just a marvelous um, presentation as well. So I, I know I'm going to forget somebody who needs to be thanked, but Terry White gave us the use of his band room, which is really, really helpful because there aren't many spaces that we can accommodate the whole class. Seif, the teachers, Steve for the green light, Gail Schmader for doing the volunteer. And I think for our team members, people who can be a little hesitant, it's not really easy to step outside of your own comfort zone. It's a lot easier to sit there and do your math lesson, but having the courage to say, okay, we'll give it a try. And I think the children had a marvelous week. Um, two more people I thought of, um, Kathy Clough, we uh, enlisted her help to take pictures because obviously all of us were teaching. So she ran around five or six different times and took numerous pictures along with Holly Smurvog. And so ultimately we're going to end up with a slideshow or a um, PowerPoint. And when that happens, I will give you all the opportunity to see that. Um, and I, it was funny, just as I was coming in, I ran into Karen because I promised her an article for The View. But it'll probably be everything I just said. <laughs> but thank you for listening, and um, thank you for giving us the chance to just open up to a different opportunity. Um, we have, at the end of the whole activity, each child filled out a reflection sheet. You know, what activity did you like? What did you think? What did you learn? Why is it important to continue to study about other cultures? And we got some great responses. So we figured that kind of ties it all up. So thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Questions, comments for Kathy? Oh. Uh, I wanted to thank you as well. And I was thinking about putting this on the agenda. I just think we're working right now on the strategic plan. And we have action committees doing work and how to put this into play. And this struck me that this whole week is a paradigm for how to make the strategic plan come alive. We're teaching kids in different ways. Kids learn differently. It's exciting. We're bringing globalization in. It's a great model that hopefully we can well, make come alive throughout the rest of the school. There's so a lot of energy you. on the front end, but the satisfaction is innumerable. So, thank you. <coughs> Alan, superintendent's report. Yes. Update on consolidation. <clears throat> Update on consolidation. I'm just going to take a few minutes tonight because I've talked with you several times about it, but just to let the public know where we are at this point. Uh, on October 4th, I received a letter from Susan Gendron, who is the commissioner, indicating that from all the statistics that they had, we, were, we could apply to be a high-performing, efficient school district. With that in mind, and with the statistics that she sent along, between October 4th and December 1st, uh, one of the jobs I had to do, as did superintendents all across the state, was to write a December 1st report. And what that report was supposed to reflect was our community as far as uh, the income, the, the, the way students uh, receive their education, what they do, our population, et cetera. And then there were four specific categories that I had to look at in particular. Because we are funded under a formula called the Essential Programs and Services Model, or EPS is what you hear about over and over again, what the uh, commissioner and the legislature were saying is that they needed to look very closely at the EPS to see how closely we were conforming to that. Now, I need to, I need to say very clearly that when the EPS was adopted five years ago, it was adopted as a minimum of what school systems should have, not a maximum. So therefore, Cape Elizabeth, along with many other systems in this state, have looked at it, have looked at it as far as how you get to the minimum point of where you're supposed to be, and then look at it from there to decide what kind of programs you'll have above and beyond that. In this process of the EPS model, which is the money we get from the state, which historically has been a little over $2 million, uh, we are still waiting for reports from the state as far as what it would be this year. But there were four areas that they told us we had to take a very careful look at. Because of the work that's going on across the state around, with consolidation of school systems uh, and the attempt to move from uh, to over 200 school systems down to uh, a maximum of 80 school systems, uh, one of the places we had to take a very close look was in central office. And so what we had to look at is if we were meeting the EPS level, now that does not mean that we had to meet it, but if we were meeting it, they had set a goal of $204 per student as far as making that, making that model. 
Um, the other pieces to it were a 5% uh, reduction in our uh, facilities and maintenance budget, 5% in transportation, and originally 5% in special education, although we've heard that may be set aside. I need to be really clear that that does not mean that I need to make the cuts to get down to that level, but I need to be able to show where we are in that model. And by the initial model, we are below 4% per student, which therefore keeps us at the EPS level. It doesn't keep us at the, the final level, but it keeps us in that area. So for December 1st, what I did was to put, put together an initial report where I looked at those four areas of finances along with all the other pieces and had a report of approximately 65 pages to send to the commissioner. Uh, in meeting with the board just prior to that, the board's feeling was, and I agree with the board, that we probably did not need to send all the statistics that I had put together. So at that point, the report was changed, and so it moved from a 65-page report to a 34-page report, and it's this report right here. This went to the commissioner and was on her desk by December 1st. Uh, we waited a while, and then on December 14th, I received a letter from the commissioner. Uh, if you read the papers, you saw that they, she reported that every system except one in the state presented their uh, plans to the commissioner. What was not reported at that point is most of them were not accepted because they were not considered as complete, which was a piece we were told beforehand we could do. Uh, as a result of that, she has sent some statistics on to us, which have changed a second time. Uh, we are dealing with a, uh, what they call an Exhibit A report. Uh, I am in the process of revising that report, and I have to have it ready by fe uh, February 14th uh, to send to the commissioner. Uh, in the meantime, and the board and I have discussed it, uh, I am putting the initial report together for the board to review and make decisions on just how they want to do this report. But the baseline is, is what we're looking at, is that we would be considered a high-performing, efficient district, and that we would have that status for at least three years. That is the current uh, understanding we have from the commissioner. Uh, to be very honest with you, when I go to the legislative report, which is next, uh, this has been a major issue. It is, continues to be a major issue, both in the legislature. And uh, we met last night with the town council. I went over this report very carefully. Uh, board members put their piece in about it as well. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over all of the things that I went over last night, but only to say that uh, this is a report and this is a process which has become more and more difficult as we move along. And I think another piece to the report, which we are still up in the air on, is has also changed the process of getting a budget accepted. If the current legislation stays in place, what will happen is this, I will write a budget, which I'm in the process of doing now. It will go to the board. The board will review it. They will decide on what that budget should look like, look at, look like, excuse me, and we'll make that vote from there. That budget will then go to the town council. The town council will review it, and they will make their recommendation. Historically, that's the process we've always gone through. Right now, according to the legislation, there was one more step, and that step is that within 10 days of the town council decision, this has to go to the voters of Cape Elizabeth uh, to look at the budget and to give a yes or no vote based on what the town council has said to us. Uh, I keep saying that is the way it is right now because there is legislation in Augusta to change that date to 2009, but I don't know where that's going to go. So uh, the town council has built their agenda for reviewing our budget uh, based on the need for having a community input on that budget. So right now, the steps that I see are this. We fall under the uh, plan of high-performing, efficient school system. We need to, I need to re continue to do a report to the commissioner, which gives some of the information, and that is a report the board will look at and eventually. Uh, we also need to be prepared for the budget process itself, and we also need to be prepared at this point for a public vote, and which I think not only Cape Elizabeth, but most communities across the state are going to find uh, a difficult process uh, for the understanding. And the vote, if it does come, has, uh, has, can only have one of two ballots. One ballot that says we are meeting the EPS uh, level, which we don't know yet because we haven't received it from the state, or 
we are meeting the EPS level and we'll need X amount of money above and beyond in order to maintain our schools. And that second piece is the piece that we have gone to the public many times on. But it is a very different picture. And so we will be moving ahead from there. And in the meantime, we are budgeting. Uh, I have met with all of my cost center managers, uh, have reviewed the budget. Uh, Pauline is currently putting the budget into the computer uh, so that we will have a picture of what our budget looks like uh, within the next three weeks. And then we will start the review by the school board at that point in time. So that's a quick overview. And I would <coughs> sit back and let anyone else comment who would like to. Rebecca. Uh, thanks, Kathy. Uh, Alan, if I, I'd like to just um, add my own personal uh, viewpoint of what's going on. It's, um, as from conversations with you and also with our representative and town councilor, Cynthia Dill, there seems to be a lot of uh, vagueness around exactly what the Department of Education is looking for in this, this quote-unquote December 1 report. Um, in fact, I just received information today from sure. Cynthia in a, that she had a conversation with, um, I believe, Representative Far Farrington, um, whom she worked very hard with uh, last year at the legislative session. His take on um, what the DO, the, the goal of the DOE is knowing that there is going to be cuts in the EPS funding for those categories. They want assurances that, that will not be made up for out of educational programming. They're trying to maintain the goal that they stated at the beginning, which is we are cutting um, overhead and not educational programming. And perhaps their fear is, is that when they cut <laughs> logically so, central office funding by 50%, that perhaps a school district may shift some funding out of educational programming to make up some of the differences. Now, the caveat to all of this is, is that that is Representative Farrington's interpretation. And how do we go about getting a very clear understanding of what the true goal is with the DOE. So my follow-up question to Cynthia is exactly that, that I, the light went on. I said, that makes sense. I can see why they would want assurances from the district that we will not do that. Um, how do we know that if we present that um, information to the DOE that we're not going to get told that it's inadequate again? So um, I know it's kind of early for the legislative report, but I thought this probably would make the best sense to, to, to mention this. Certainly. I think it is. <clears throat> Alan, go this, ahead. This isn't a question, well, sort of a question. Um, in preparing information for the view, actually, I was trying to find <coughs> dates on when we have workshops and when the public can participate in the budget process, and I don't think they're on the website. Uh, are we going to? Yes, we are. those will go on the website. I have sent them on to the view, so they will have it first. Okay. And I have just, uh, was it last week I met with Michael to determine what our final schedule is? So they will be ready for the website to go on there. Uh, what will happen at this point, they will go on the website up to the end of your discussion with the public yeah. and your vote. We will hold off on the town council piece until we know what route they need to take because if they need to take a route that's based on the public vote, it will have a different picture than if they're going to do the uh, traditional route. Okay, that's fine. Yep. More importantly, yep. since we, if the public does have to vote, I would like to think they would yep. be more involved. Yep. Definitely, definitely. Um, so, uh, have you covered the legislative review as well? Uh, all I will say about the legislative review, I know that uh, uh, Rebecca is our legislative uh, board member. Uh, I also serve uh, the State Superintendents Association on their legislative committee. And so I spent, today, Tuesday? Yeah, I spent yesterday in Augusta looking at that. I will tell you that uh, right now, in the next two or three weeks, mo all of the business in the legislature will be around consolidation. Uh, there are four pages 
of uh, bills that are going before them now that range anywhere from throwing out the consolidation altogether to adjusting it, including the adjustment that I said about the public vote. Uh, I had uh, Andrea, my, my secretary, has made a copy of that, and that will come to you tomorrow, so you will have that. <coughs> Uh, so that will be the major work of January. In February and March, then they have developed other uh, law uh, bills to go before the legislature. Uh, I do have those, and I've reviewed those, and I'll also be giving you a copy of what they'll be doing there, plus copies of any specific ones you'd like to have. Uh, this is, if you remember correctly, the second year of the legislature, legislative session. It's supposed to be more or less emergency legislation. This. <laughs> In the opinion of a lot of us, it is emergency legislation. It isn't all shown that way. But the emergency le legislation for most of us in the state right now is to see where will consolidation be when they close the legislature around the end of <coughs> April and what will be happening there. So I will be keeping you informed. Uh, unfortunately, I probably am a little too overly informed because I do serve on the state legislative committee. But I also think it's really important that we watch the process. Thank you, Alan. Um, introduction of Ian. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Christian, yeah. Alan, was there any discussion there of table two? I, we, I, was that last night I heard the comment on that? Table two, apparently there is work being done. And there are signatures I'm looking at, Rebecca, because she may have a little more information than I do. But my understanding is that table two is in the works at this point in time. Uh, yeah, table two is coming. Um, what is of... I believe the last I heard is that what makes Tabor 2 different than Tabor 1 is they have removed education from it. Given what happened around consolidation, um, they have removed education spending from the, the scope oh. of the limits. That's what I heard, yeah, several months ago. Um, and I also s suspect this is my personal editorial here, but I suspect that it makes it more palatable. They, I believe the supporters of Tabor 2 believe it will make it more pal palatable to the voters of Maine, that perhaps that that was one of the big hurdles that couldn't quite get over for the first couple of times, and that if they remove education from it, maybe it will actually get passed. So I'll, I'll, I definitely have my ear <coughs> pressed to the ground on this one, and I'll let you know when I hear more. <coughs> What's that, Karen? <laughs> I was just I'm trying to think that through. How do you just remove the education component from that? You, you write it the way you want to write it. OK. You know, I would, I would offer you a possibility. <coughs> I don't know if this is true. I haven't looked at all of this. We're looking at consolidation of school systems at this point. We're looking at consolidation of the jails. We're looking at consolidation in many areas. I have heard by rumor that there is a possibility of consolidation of towns and trying to consolidate town government. I don't know if that will happen, and I don't know if that's a part of this, but I certainly have heard discussions about that at this point in time. Alan, introduction of Andrea as new administrative assistant to the superintendent. Yes, a couple of words about this. Uh, first of all, you remember the last month was Mary's last month here. She was done as of December 31st. Uh, I have a letter here for all of you just as a thank you note for the gift that you gave her. And as Mary has said in here, she reflects on the many, many years she has had in Cape Elizabeth and the wonderful opportunities she's had as a teacher, uh, as a uh, certification person, and as the uh, administrative assistant to the superintendent. Uh, in that process, during the month of December, uh, I had uh, advertised the position. I had a lot of applications. I was quite pleased. Out of those applications, we, inter we attend a, a plan to interview six. We ended up interviewing five candidates. Uh, we went back for a second round of interviews for some of those candidates. Uh, I did hire Andrea Fuller, who has come on board, came on board uh, the, the day after Christmas, and has been working with me ever since. Andrea has done a tremendous job. This is a learning curve for her, but it's, she's a very fast learner, and so there have been many changes in the office. You'll note that she's not here this evening to take the notes. And the reason is, is because Mary, uh, because she also did certification, uh, fit the Department of Labor law where you could give her a contract as opposed to an hourly rate. 
Because I am not having Andrea do those things, because the certification has been moved out of my office, uh, then I am paying Andrea an hourly rate at this point in time. So that is why. So we're going into modern way of doing things, is we are taking the tape of this meeting tonight, uh, and she will do the minutes of this meeting from that tape and also from a uh, uh, voice uh, option also so that she can do the minutes and uh, keep them up from there. But I think all of you have been in to meet Andrea. I hope that the public has made note that she is the uh, superintendent secretary or much more uh, nicely said the administrative assistant to the superintendent and uh, therefore people are changing their mail over to make sure that Andrea is getting it and I think you will all find that Andrea is uh, knows her stuff and is doing a tremendous job. She came originally out of, a, out of legal firms where she was working, uh, then went to work and I say this carefully, in the South Portland Public uh, Schools in their central office and is now here uh, doing the job for us. And so I truly appreciate the work she's doing and she, she will be an excellent secretary. And we welcome Andrea to our group. Uh, update on Chinese language program, Jack. Okay, um, first um, we have begun some examination of the way to do a Chinese language program, um, I'd first like to say thank you to all of the parents that have called me or contacted me in one way or another to express support. I think that's very important to the school board as well as to the school administrators to know that there is that base of parent support for introducing a Chinese language uh, program. Um, since the last meeting, I've had several meetings uh, with Jeff Shedd at the high school. Uh, Tom Eismeyer, and also in one of my meetings with Jeff, I met with Angela Schapani, who heads the Foreign Languages Program at the high school. Um, the, the objective in all of these meetings has been to try to develop a plan uh, to see whether it's feasible to do an application for a guest teacher program, uh, which is sponsored by the College Board here in the U.S., Hanban in China. And the way that sponsorship works is they accept applications from school systems for a guest teacher from China. Uh, the government of China pays the stipend for the teacher, pays the international transportation costs, and the local school system has the responsibility for local housing and local transportation, which is very, very low cost. Among the calls I've had from parents, several people have volunteered to host a Chinese teacher too, so we're all set there. One thing I need to make mention of is right now my name is too strongly associated with this initiative. Um, I went to a program up at Colby College on November 30th to learn about the opportunities for Chinese instruction. What I did not know was there was someone else there from Cape Elizabeth, Angela Schipani, head of the Foreign Languages Department was there. It's too bad we didn't know each other before we went there because we would have met and talked about it. And one thing I should also mention beyond that is that Perhaps a year ago, well before I was involved with any of this, Jeff Shedd had already started to plant the idea that we should look at Chinese language instruction in the Cape Elizabeth school system. Um, and so he, Jeff is really more the father of this than, than I am. Um, in the last meeting I had with Jeff and Angela Schipani, uh, Jeff agreed to uh, form a stakeholder ad hoc group uh, to look at the feasibility of an application for a guest teacher this year. And that's where it stands right now. Jeff has put together an ad hoc group consisting of school administrators, school staff, parents, and school board members. And I believe our first meeting is scheduled for a week from today, is it, Jeff? Or? Those notices haven't gone up yet. But okay. But, and and um, Jeff, would you like to say a few more words about, about the whole process? I guess that the only thing that I would add, because I think you're, it's a very accurate summary of sort of where we are in our discussions, um, is that I would say I, I look at the purpose of the committee a little bit more broadly than just looking at the feasibility of a particular application to the college board program. Um, and that program that Jack is talking that Jack is talking about is a, sort of a collaborative between the college board and the Hanban, which both Jack and Angela learned about, I think, at the at that um, meeting about bringing Chinese language instruction to Maine. 
to me, the bigger the bigger issue is is in addition to looking at feasibility that even it's it's to look at feasibility and it's to look at if it's if that's the best way and if the timing is right, um, because um, I, I don't regard myself as the father of looking at Chinese and it really wasn't like over a year ago it was a little bit less than that but but I'll certainly accept that accept that as it's something I've always been interested in I'm supportive of it the foreign language department is supportive of the concept but wanting to do things the right way um, and I think we're at it I, I, I sort of analogize where we are in my mind anyway it's like we're I'm sort of a surfer and I want to have the best ride I want to have the best wave catch that best wave and not necessarily the first one um, and I think that's the right way to approach um, curriculum change and this is a big curriculum change if we do it and I think um, it's it's been fun talking with Jack and he's certainly been provoking my thinking um, and that's a good thing and the purpose of the stakeholder group is to continue that discussion and try to get more people involved in the process and decide what that best wave is. Does that sound like a, that's, that's, that's where I am. Yeah, thanks Jeff. May I, if I could just add a couple of words to this too. Uh, I think the, for us to look at the possibilities of bringing Chinese into uh, Cape Elizabeth is very important. I think also, at the same time, if you work with school departments, you know there are, pro there are steps in the process. And uh, I was quite interested in receiving the other day a resume from a person who lives in Keenan, Maine, outside of Skowhegan. I cannot pronounce his first name because I don't speak ch uh, Chinese, but his last name is Ladd, and I can say that, L-A-D-D. -D. But anyway, what, it be what I began to find out is that there are people more locally available who can come in and do some work with us as well in that process. So I, I think it is important for us to be very clear that we are not looking at getting rid of languages. We are possibly looking at adding languages. But I think uh, Jeff would say, as I would as a principal, as Tom would as a principal, as Steve would as a principal, whenever you make additions, you have to look at very carefully the entire picture of your schools and the entire picture of the school system. To add any subject means you've got to rearrange your day because contractually you have only a certain number of hours in every day. And so I, 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 uh, certainly Jack has done so much uh, investigation of this is just amazing, the amount of information that he has found and put together. And I think we need to begin to take this look. But we need to look at it from the perspective of that we are protecting what we have and moving on from there based on what we're seeing internationally. And we are told that in the next 20 to 25 years it will be an extremely important language in an extremely important country that is growing rapidly. Uh, and also we need to look at India and what is also happening there. Uh, so I, I think I would, would speak for Jack, uh, to Jack and for uh, Jeff and, and for Tom because we've each had those conversations. We see this happening. But we also see that there is a process that we'll need to go through in order to get to that point. And so uh, I think it's exciting. I think the possibilities are amazing. I think for students who uh, go to uh, Cape Elizabeth schools, why do I keep doing that? Who are going to Cape Elizabeth schools, uh, it will be an, a, a great adventure for them because we have many students who like the adventure of education. And so uh, I look forward to the movement ahead I look forward to working with the foreign language teachers because I have heard by, from Jeff that there is an enormous amount of interest amongst our foreign language teachers, including some who have actually said they would be interested in looking at, be, at becoming partial instructors of Chinese as well. Mm. So we have some, some really good possibilities here to look at in, the, in that process. Thank you. Yeah, I would just want to add one other thing. It's amazing to me that you have a resume that showed up based on an article on my website from a teacher, and I had contact from another person who was interested in coming to Cape Elizabeth to teach Chinese. And it's, you know, the reason I bring this up is it says a lot about the strength of Cape Elizabeth in a school system. You know, as soon as the beginnings of an opportunity appear, you know, people are interested in, in possibly coming here, which is, you know, very, very gratifying to all of us involved with education here. And I'm passing those on to you, the resume. Uh, I think it's really important for you to know that this is a person who attended the capital <clears throat> Jingmao University in Beijing, uh, Beijing University of Technology, uh, so has a very strong background and has been working in Skowhegan Area High School. 
with, with the language and with his expertise. So I think that's really important. I'm not saying that we're hiring this person or anyone else, but it's just it's interesting to see yes. that there are those resources yeah. here in Maine. Thank you, Jack. Kirsten? Yeah, I'd definitely like to add my support to the Chinese language program because I know going through high school I always thought that it would be, um, especially in our increasingly globalized world, that it would be very um, helpful to have a Chinese language. And so last month at the meeting I was really intrigued by the introduction to this and I would definitely like to see that come to our schools. Good. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, Unfinished business, Trish, consideration of policies for second reading. Um, okay, the first <coughs> policy for second reading is ILA, which is the assessment system. Um, we did make one change at the policy committee meeting. There were no comments at the school board meeting. However, one, the policy committee meeting, we would like to recommend that section six, you can see it, it's crossed out. Um, the reason why we're recommending doing this is because the current CIA team is this advisory committee and we didn't feel that we wanted sort of redundant that we didn't really want to re-specify um, so uh, I'd like to present for approval ILA as you see here Trish I just noticed something I'm so sorry but okay. so sick Oh, I'm sorry. So you're restating. We renumbered, and there's still an, there's still reference to an advisory committee. We just took out the specifics of who it's going right. to be. Right. Okay. Sorry. That's great. Okay. So we have a motion from Trish and a second from Linda. Additional discussion. Okay. All in favor of JG student placement? No. ILA assessment okay. system. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're on first reading. Yeah, I apologize. ILA assessment system. Seven zero. Um, the next one is truancy. There were no changes or comments from the first reading. The policy committee doesn't have any other changes. And again, this one is almost straight out of the legislative books. So I'd like to move that we approve policy JHB truancy as presented. Thank you, Trish. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Jack. Discussion? All in favor? 7-0. Um, the next policy, JICFA, which is student hazing, we're recommending that it's deleted because, and you're starting to see some of the overlap, much of this student hazing is covered in several other policies, including one that we're going to be looking at next. Um, so I move that we delete policy JICFA from our policy binder. Thank you, Trish. Second. Thank you, Linda. Discussion? All in favor? 7-0. Um, the last one we're presenting for second reading is JICIA, which is Weapons, Violence, Bullying, and Safety. Um, this, we have this policy. Um, what's been amended is um, the requirement to include bullying language in our policies. As you see it presented here is um, recommendations from Drummond and Woodson. So I'd like to move that we approve policy JICIA as presented. Thank you, Trish. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Discussion? I said one, one question on the page three, the note, the main law on bullying requires the state to provide local school units with training modules on bullying and harassment. I was just curious, is that something that they are funding or that we have to pick up the cost? Is there a, and I don't know if that's a question you can answer, but. I think we talked about this at policy, the policy committee. It, we, there's leeway in how you define the training modules. So there is, st there is staff training around okay. bullying. At this, on the state's, the state's no, expense. not really on the state's expense at our okay. expense. Other discussion? All in favor? 7-0. Now we can move on to new business. Trish? If, can I just add one thing because I did have a couple emails today. I just wanted to remind people that all the school policies are on the school website. And how you get to that is, 
and I don't mean to be detailed because I did have th two or three emails on how to get to them. You've got to get to the school website. You've got to click on the superintendents, uh, the school board section, and then go down to the policies. And they're labeled, the labels that we're reading, like JG, they're categorized by the topic of the policy. So if you click on that, you can then find the policies. The policies that are on the website, it does say that it's under construction. The ones that are on there are the ones that we have been updating. Uh, or actually, all of them are up there. Some of them are very old because we're in the process of updating them. But I would encourage people to sort of check periodically because, as you can see, as we do these monthly meetings, we're constantly updating them. Okay. Trish, I'll just add one thing. Go. Um, just let people know that you don't have to actually know the policy code or even title. All you need to do is put in a keyword in the search, um, and it will actually find you policies that are related to that. So it's a really powerful tool. Thank you for clarifying, because I think it would be great if people periodically refer to the policies that we work so hard on. Um, okay, I'm sorry. No, first Go ahead. reading. Yes. The policies we'd like to present for first reading. Um, the first one is JG, student placement within the schools. Um, and you will note that's uh, the changes have been in bold. You will note supporting that are three guidelines, actually, JG-R, all labeled that. One is for Pond Cove, one is for middle school, and attached to the middle school are the accelerated program guidelines that were referred to but that weren't in your original packet, and um, a high school placement guideline. Um, and this is a recommendation by... Robert this is a recommendation. Yeah, some of this, yes, some of the, actually on this one, um, it hasn't been updated in a while. This was primary, this is um, really a discussion of the policy. This is a recommendation of the policy committee. Thank you. And I think on this one, since there's not as much legalese, is like similar to truancy, Drummond and Woodsum has reviewed this, so we've reflected their, any comments they have, but this is primarily, this is a recommendation of the policy committee. Trish, I did notice something in reviewing this that, um, in all grades, with the exception of fifth and sixth, parents and or students have an opportunity to provide information before placement, um, whether it be a course schedule um, for seventh and eighth and then high school level, or it's the letters that parents send in Pond Cove ahead of time. The only grades that there is no opportunity for that, as written in this policy, is fifth and sixth. And I'm wondering if that might just have been overlooked. We can certainly look at that. I'm wondering, though, in the middle school placement, the first paragraph says, in the spring, parents and guardians will be given the opportunities to submit input to the principal or guidance counselors about their children's learning style and educational needs. That's pretty clear. Yeah. So it doesn't preclude any grades. I think then it gets into specifics. We can certainly look at maybe there's too much detail below. Well, because what I think what, it, um, what triggered my question was that in one, two, three, four, the fifth paragraph down, it does refer in the spring seventh and eighth grade students will complete a course selection. And I didn't really see anything specifically detailing how the fifth and sixth graders would go about providing input. So, you know, I'm okay. I, I don't think I actually really read that first paragraph very carefully, so. Well, we can take a look at it. Just a yeah. second look at policy, okay. Um, all right, the next policy is um, ACAA, which is harassment and sexual harassment of students. Um, again, this policy is based, is being updated for the bullying, <coughs> primarily referencing. So there were three policies that we've added bullying language on. And again, that's Drummond and Woodson recommendation as well as legislative changes. Um, and that's it. If anyone has any questions or comments that come up, our, we're meeting next week, so please share them. All set? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Moving on to consideration of proposal for second John Hopkins Model UN conference uh, trip. Alan? Yes. You have in your packet a three-page uh, presentation by Gretchen McNulty. Uh, as you will remember, they did go to one earlier in Princeton. 
Uh, at that point in time, when you had considered it, she, she, I think she had presented four possibilities to us at that point in time. You had turned the Princeton one over to me, or her first one that she wanted to go to, and so I approved the Princeton one. Uh, this now comes back to you. This is a request to go to Johns Hopkins uh, United Nations Conference. It's on Tuesday, February 26. Uh, she has listed here contact information, uh, transportation information. She's put in here the information that also goes to the students about the, the expectations, et cetera. And uh, she's also talked about uh, this, how they will stay, where they will stay, and how that will be operated. Unfortunately, uh, I forgot to bring down with me the one that is signed, but I do have one that I have signed. Jeff hasn't signed it yet. And uh, so once, once this is, if this is approved, then we'll move on from there. And Jeff, I know that you have talked with Gretchen. I didn't know if you had any other things you wanted to add to this or not. Um, just a couple of things. Um, the students will be missing one day of school. Um, and as it turns out, one of the things I asked her today is, in terms of the kids who are coming, are they the same kids <coughs> who went to the Princeton Model UN, or are they not? And in fact, there's virtually no overlap. I think there's two kids who are seniors who went on the Princeton one who may be going on this one as well, but that's two out of 24 for the, most of the kids. This is a, a new experience, which also obviously limits the numbers of days that, in total that they're going to be out of school for, for the Model UN. Um, and I did ask Gretchen as well, sort of in the big picture, uh, where she sees in terms of future conferences this year, and she said the only one she sees as a possibility, and she's not committed to it, is the USM conference in, in, uh, I think it's in, I think it's in Portland and not Guam. But she hasn't made up her mind about that one as well, and I think she wants to talk to the kids. So. And one of you asked me about a snow day. <laughs> and uh, the snow day really comes from the place where it is being held. Uh, as, as you may know, the last one, we did have a snow day. And uh, planes were not able to get out of New Jersey. So we did, I uh, worked with Gretchen over the weekend. We did get the kids home by train. Uh, it was a little extra expense, but we found a way to take care of that. But uh, as far as snow dates are concerned, uh, the snow date will be determined by Johns Hopkins. And uh, therefore, if we are in having a storm here, a predicted storm, then Gretchen would make decisions on whether we would go to participate at that point in time. Do we have no school either that Thursday or that Friday? You said there was a, they were missing one day of school? They missed they, they leave on Thursday afternoon, is my understanding, so I will leave there in school. Actually, Thursday morning at 5.30 a.m., so they missed two days, because we have school that March 1st. I misread it. Okay. March 1st of February 29th. All right, right. I'm leaving here. It is. Sorry about that. So it's Thursday and Friday that they would miss school. Oh, I'm sorry, it says 5.30 a.m. <laughs> a.m. p.m., whatever. <laughs> Thank you. She did also say that, that, that airline fares have increased a fair amount since she first started looking into this trip. So even this one is not a completely done deal, because um, she needed to wait until the school board made a decision today about blocking something out. Any idea if the train transportation is less? Because the train basically runs regardless of what the weather is, um, and um, I know the train. And I know the train goes to Washington, so I. I don't know. I will check and see. I, I don't know. I know she's a big fan of the train, so maybe she'd already check it. But I was sort of it. Yeah. I mean, it'd just be well. That doesn't mean that John Hopkins wouldn't cancel because of the snow day. I'm just thinking of the transportation. So. Uh, other questions? Uh, we need to vote on this, do we not? Yes. Is there a motion? Go ahead. Um, I move that we approve the Cape Elizabeth High School World Affairs Council um, trip, the John Hopkins United Nations Conference, as presented by our superintendent. Thank you, Karen. Is there a second? Second. Trish and Jack. <laughs> Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? 7 0. Great. Hannaford Field presentation by school board reps. Um, I wasn't sure, Linda or Peter, 
and or both. Well, the Hannaford Field Committee had a very brief meeting last week um, to discuss a proposal that had been discussed at our previous meeting. Um, I have supplied all of the board members with the information from both of those meetings, which included a packet um, of information from one of the vendors that the Hennepin Field Committee has uh, looked at quite closely. The proposal included seating for approximately 1,431 people at the field. Uh, it also included all of the understructure for a scorer's or press box to be placed on the, at the center of the bleachers. There were drawings included in the packet that I sent out to everybody to try and give them some type of visual effect of what it would look like down at the field to the best of my ability with some additional explanations. And um, the packet I sent out did generate some questions from some of the board members and without repeating, there were a lot of similar questions from different board members, but I would like to let the public know just some of the questions that were asked by the board here. Uh, we were asked about what is the lifespan of the bleachers, and I actually contacted the vendor myself so that I could get a pretty good idea from them. And they said as long as the structure is maintained, there's a lifespan of 20 to 30 years or quite possibly even more. Um, the biggest problem that they have run into is if there are corrosive materials such as dirt or grass or um, excessive water um, onto part of the structure, any of the steel parts of the structure. But it hasn't been an issue so far, and so we don't foresee that that will be a problem here as well, as long as we kept track of any erosion that was happening on site and made sure that it stayed away from the structure. Um, we were asked what are the sizes of bleachers at some of our other areas, and actually the vendor was able to provide us with some written estimates from some of our other competing schools, and they ran anywhere from 800 to seating capacity of over 2,000. So it kind of gives you an idea of, you know, the different projects that just this particular vendor has done in this, in this area. Um, uh, let me see. And that's um, what you sent today. Correct. Okay. Correct. That list, uh, it, was, it was entitled References, but on there it, it gave you a list of the schools, which included, I just believe. just want to make sure that's what people picked up yep. their emails today. That's yeah, what. I go back. Okay. Does anybody have a copy of that? I left mine at home. As I said, I have extra copies of just about everything I've sent out in case you sure can come. Um, let me see. Um, how often do we need seating for 1,400? And this afternoon, I just handed out to everybody at their desk, uh, their seats this evening, as I had asked Keith to provide us with some estimates of what we have had for attendance at some of our, uh, some of the games, excluding naturally the two large football games that we had, which nobody has an exact count, but we know that whatever leisure proposal was put before us tonight, it wouldn't be sufficient to cover those types of crowds. And we're aware of that situation, but it's, again, it's not going to be an everyday event down at the field. So excluding those games, um, there are several of them that we're estimating crowds anywhere from 200 to about 1,200, depending on whether they were football, whether they were lacrosse, soccer, et cetera. But, and, and again, these are just his best estimates based on some of the um, gate receipts that we have received. And we also have to look at it from this perspective that, again, this is a very new project. This fall was, was our initial season, so we are hoping to see uh, greater attendance as the field gets used more in the future. But just to give us some idea of where we, what type of use we've seen on the field so far. There was a question asking if we had discussed the possibility of movable structures, um, if they would, you know, could possibly cost less. Um, it was briefly discussed at the Hannaford Field Committee, and I say that because they did look into the possibility of portable bleachers. We would still need 
the same type of uh, excavation at the site because if we were to use portable bleachers, number one, the site that we put them on would have to be perfectly level, which as time goes by, it's going to create more maintenance just for the site, just for the platform to send any portable bleachers on. As well, we would have to provide some type of storage facility for portable bleachers, and then we would actually have to have some way of moving the bleachers from site to site. So it didn't look like it was really that a very practical idea as far as a cost savings for this type of thing. Um, and what are the ongoing costs? Basically, these are all uh, galvanized steel and aluminum type structures. According, and again, believe me, I'm not an engineer. I'm just taking this. <laughs> I want to make that clear. Uh, speaking, speaking with the company themselves, um, they said they are pretty much maintenance free. I mean, they need to be cleaned just due to spillage from spectators and so forth. Um, they do need to be checked on an annual basis to make sure there's no corrosive materials, et cetera, et cetera. So um, really should not create a, a maintenance nightmare for any of us, which was a very nice thing. Um, probably the biggest question that I received from most of our members had to do with the financial impact and how it might impact the schools. Um, we assured them that from day one, both Peter and I have been very upfront with all of the members of the Hanover Field Committee, that the schools could not be expected to bear any of the financial burden of this project. Not to say that we weren't supportive of the bleachers. However, our first concern, as always, has been for the educational programming and services of our students. Um, athletics is, is part, of a, a part of the programs that we offer here. We're very proud of all the programs that we offer here. However, this is an expense in declining budget years that we've seen over the last three years. Looking forward to another potentially tough budget year. It's just not an expense that we can, we can bear at this time. So, and that was, it really wasn't questioned by any of the committee members at that point in time. So, that being said, I would like to, um, based on the recommendation from the Hanford Field Committee, I move that the Cape Elizabeth School Board support the recommended proposal which includes construction of bleachers as set forth in the written proposal and drawings from the Gallivan Company, including foundation, bleachers, and under support structure of a scorer's box. Funding of the project is to be a cooperative effort, 50% town funds, 50% privately raised contributions. The town of Cape Elizabeth shall provide funding not to exceed $150,000, and the remainder of the cost to be privately raised funds. Um, the approximate cost of the existing proposal is $315,000. $276,250 of that would be with the Galvan Company. The additional funds are site work, engineering permits, and other extraneous fees that would be involved. Sufficient funds to complete the project will be raised and in the possession of the town prior to the execution of a contract with the vendor and while recognizing the desire to enhance the functionality of the Hanford Field, the school board supports the proposal for the bleachers. However, our primary responsibility is to provide the best possible educational services and programs to our students. Should the town's support of the project negative, negatively impact the financial support of the school district, our support for the bleachers will be rescinded. I'm glad that's in writing. <clears throat> Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Peter. Discussion? Oh, my God. Yeah. Go ahead, Trisha. Um, first, I want to thank the Hannaford Field Committee and Peter and Linda for all of your work on this. You've spent an inordinate amount of time, and it's appreciated. Um, one question that was asked, and you did provide us with lots of data, and thank you for the attendance, is if we opted for a slightly smaller seating capacity, and I think the next level was perhaps 900 or so. It seems based on some of the attendance um, figures that that would be reasonable. Um, does the motion, or, or I guess that's, I'm not sure. <laughs> the motion was very specific. It, I guess I tossed that out for discussion, the size and the seating capacity. 
Trish, I think, uh, excuse me, Rebecca, did you have something? You, you look uh, like. Oh, no, I'm taking it all in. Okay. <laughs> I'll jump in on that. Um, I agree with Trish. I am um, in looking over all of it. And first of all, I got to say, um, Linda and Peter have done an, an amount of work that's just tremendous. And thank you so much for all your time and all your detail and so forth. I, that's probably one of the longer motions I've heard. Um, but I, I um, and I've, I've, I've gone through this and I've looked it over and I've sort of been back and forth and so forth. And I, and I sort of am where uh, Trish is, is I, I'm wondering if maybe something in the, uh, the thousand 996 or, or whatever it is that you gave us um, as a potential other might be something that we could support um, and and it would be a little less expensive and uh, um, we'd still be supporting it because I, I know I've gone to a lot of games there. I've stood there. I've tried to sit there. I've taken a blanket. It's a little cold. Um, I asked Alan if I could stand on his shoulders and he said no. And, uh, you know, I've enjoyed games there and it would be great to be able to sit there. Um, and I recognize that um, how expensive things can be. And I recognize what a tough budget season we're going to. So I'd be more inclined to support something maybe of a, a, a less than 1,500, maybe 1,000. Um, and that's just sort of where I'm thinking about. So. And just out of curiosity, what is the cost difference between the 1,500 versus 1,000 seat capacity? Well, has that right in front of her. Yeah. I think it was about 35,000. Let me just look at I think you sent that to us. Yeah, I thought um, it was two, yep. 240,000 for 996 yep. seats. Um, again, 4490 from Galavan. Um, yep, it was coming That's out next to, to me. be about 240,490, and that again excluded the actual construction of the scorer's box. It would provide for the understructure of it. So, so it'd be about two, 240,490 plus the extraneous fees. Plus which, another about $39,000. Which the fees we incur one way or the other, no matter Correct. what the size is. Correct. Because that's the understructure <coughs> and the layman. Okay. Well, the, the fees, the permits, the engineering, and all of that. Okay. And so, again, those are just, that was kind of a best guess mm -hmm. by uh, Michael McGovern as far as what those other costs would be. I mean, there's no way for us to pinpoint those until we get, you know, the engineer's report and the site report and all that. So. I do want to toss one. Oh, sorry. I'm going to. Uh, before we go too far down this conversation about size and money, if we're saying the schools are not paying for the bleachers, um, I'm not sure it's in, uh, within our purview then to be um, making an issue of size around money and finances. I think that if we have an issue with the size for functional reasons or other things like that, then, then I think that that would fall within our scope. Um, but I'm thinking maybe we need to take that language out in terms of, of, of the, the size. I think that's a conversation perhaps the town council and the um, Hannaford um, field, committee. field committee should have. Um, you know, so for, for, for me, when I look at this, 1,200, is that right, 1,200 seats? It sounds like a 15. lot. 1,500. Sounds like a lot. Um, my questions would be, how big is that on the field? How, you know, how imposing is it? Is it something that we really want to have on our, on our facilities? But the town council says, yeah, we'll support that, and it will not affect the school budget, then do we really have an issue with it? Well, and of course, we have the, the, the scenario that's set up is that Hannaford Field makes a recommendation to the school board. The school board supports, rejects, or changes and makes a, a recommendation to the town council. Um, and I hear what you're saying. Um, and if if you wanted to change it, I would have an um, I'd be interested in a thousand seats, and the the appearance aesthetically, 
-hmm. And that, of course, is, is um, something that the school board should be considering. Um, and so if you set the money aside, um, I'd still have those same issues that I sort of verbalized. Yeah, I don't have a good... I Sorry, <laughs> no, no, no. I still, Linda has been so kind because I am geometrically challenged. I somebody gives me dimensions, whatever, and I cannot visualize it. And so, bless her heart, she actually went out to the parking lot and tried to look at my concern, which was how high are these bleachers going to go, and is it going to impact um, what our classrooms are going to visually have looking out. And she has assured me that it won't. But I, what I forgot to ask is that, fine, okay, we've dealt with height, but then how, you know, how long are we talking? Is it the, the whole length of the field? No. If it's we were 35-yard oh. line to the 35-yard line. Yeah, 25. Thank you. That I can the visualize. 25, 25 or 20 to 20. Yeah. <clears throat> I would actually like, I agree with your original point, the fact that um, we've made it very clear that if this were to negatively impact our school budget, um, we would rescind our support for it. Um, I actually have faith in the town council working closely with the Hannaford Field Committee. No, no. no. It that's done. That way. Well, in terms of, well, hold on. In terms of the aesthetics of the bleachers, I think there'd be a sensitivity there. Um, but if I want to make sure we're not selling ourselves short um, in terms of if we can get that extra capacity up to, I'm changing my mind on this, up to the 1,500 seats that would accommodate, it appears to be the, the size of the crowds that attend the football games on a rather consistent basis, why we'd sort of cut that short if it's at no expense to us, um, I would want us to be thoughtful about. Um, that was my comment. And maybe, um, maybe uh, Linda, excuse me, Trish, maybe Linda, you want to just um, um, <coughs> recap what the Hannaford Field Committee's charge is, because it's not for the Hannaford Field Committee Correct. to be working right. with the town council. Okay. Or maybe I, Peter. Actually, I meant to Peter. Thank you, Peter. We have to remember always how Linda and I, this same discussion going on at the podium tonight, Linda and I had numerous times over the weekend on the phone trying to figure out how we could do this so it won't come bouncing back to us. And we got back to the fact that we wanted everybody to be involved with the discussion. If you wanted to change the concept, we could do it by motion. Uh, the Hanover Field Committee was charged by the town council to make a recommendation to the school board for their consideration. If the school board chose to, they could pass on that recommendation with amendments or changes to the town council. And that's what we're doing tonight. The town council will vote on funding. We have no business telling the town council how to fund the bleachers. We're making some recommendations. And we talked about this briefly at the joint meeting we had earlier this week. At that point in time, to get back to Rebecca's concern, Jack and I can tell you when we're thinking about height considerations for something like bleachers and what visual impact it's going to have, what the planning board will do, because this has to be permitted by them. This is far from over. The planning board, when someone like yourself or the school board says we're concerned about visual impairments as to where the bleachers are going to be placed, we actually fill a large helium balloon that the, the town engineer will bring. And we raise it to the height of the bleachers. So you can sit there and say, OK, that balloon's going to be in the way. And that's how it's done. So your concerns and your questions are always welcome, Rebecca. But it, that is, we're three steps away from it. And I'm confident, and Jack sure is as well, because we're both former members of the planning board, that it will be handled by the planning board during the permitting process. And there will be numerous public hearings to which the public and every member of the board, and the board could also make a joint recommendation to the planning board at that time. And we do have weight with the planning board, especially where we have two former <laughs> members of the planning board now on the school board. So, But again, the motion that Linda verbally presented tonight was the motion that came from the Hannaford Field Committee. We had an obligation to do that. We have no authority to change what they voted by majority a number of weeks ago. So that's what we've done. We've satisfied our position as two individual members of an eight-person board. The school board is well within their rights. They ask questions. That's why Linda spent the weekend answering your questions and your compliments. You bounced around tonight. All belong to her, not to me. 
She would call me and say, what do you think? And I'd say, go ahead and do it. <laughs> <laughs> and we were concerned about how we could handle the fact that everybody would like some input into this. And it was my suggestion that we come up, that any motion that's presented to the school board, we always have the opportunity to change it or amend it. And that's where we are right now. And we're well within our means to do that. And the town council expects us to do it. And you can be assured when they get our recommendation, they'll do the same thing. It'll be changed again. And when the planning board goes through the permitting process, they'll have concerns about town codes and ordinances, and it'll be changed again. Uh, so we're not done. There's going to be numerous public hearings along the way. And we have to vote on the bond issue if that's the way they do fund it. So the public has input. We have input. And we, we just want to get the groundwork done. And I'm sure all the members of the school board realize we've talked about this for too long. We've been approached by townspeople about it for too long. And we've been criticized for not doing much. Well, now we're doing something. And we can pass this along. After lots of input from the public and the Hannaford Field Committee, the school board, and the town council, I think we can finally get something done with the support of the town in the end. And that's what we're attempting to do. But feel free to amend this motion in any way you want. And we can vote on it. If you want to talk about size or placement, you can do that. Yes, Jack. Well, excuse me, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Jack? Um, let, me, let me ask a question that sort of plays its way into my thinking about this whole thing. My understanding, based on the first year of use of Hanford Field, was that no admission was charged except for night games when the lights were on. Is that intended to be the policy that carries forward into the future, too? I believe that is the case at this point in time because as when, it, when the games first started, there was some discussion. There it was done one way, it was done another. And, you know, as we all got used to the field and what's right, what's not right, and there was a big meeting Alan had with the booster group uh -huh. and a lot of feedback there, and it was eventually changed to be night games and family pricing, family pricing senior citizen. The reason I was asking is I, I was just wondering whether the 500-seat delta would be self-supporting, you know, if you had some kind of gate charge and over a period of a few years that 500-seat sector would pay for itself because it's, it's not that much of a delta in the total cost, $35,000. Is that right? Difference. That mm -hmm. 35? It's $35,000 difference right. between difference. the 1431 right. and the 996. Right. It's actually half of that for the town. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, um, as far as the gate receipts are concerned, most of those gate receipts this first year went to pay for expenses related to the field. There was right. not a lot of left over. Right. And that's, that's why the gate, refeed, okay. gate fees were charged in the first place, is to help to cover uh, associated costs with the field, such as security, yeah. um, the lighting. Porta potties, <clears throat> potties, which were fairly expensive. Yeah. I tend to, I tend to <laughs> sort of agree where I think Kathy was going that a thousand seats is probably a good size for this. On the other hand, if the cost difference is so small, that that certainly influences my thinking. The other thing that influences my thinking is look at past attendance numbers, uh, but the future attendance numbers will be influenced by the presence of bleachers and by the attractiveness of the overall field too. So. Mm -hmm. um, I guess if the cost difference is as small as it is, I guess I would recommend staying with the proposed number. Although I have to say I really appreciate the language you put in there that recognizes the primacy of the educational mission and the secondary nature of the sports mission. We were concerned about that, Linda and I, and that was one of our in-depth discussions. And we thought the only way we could assure it is to put it in the motion. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And in the recommendation to the council is yeah. we're on record can never be said that you never said this. I would just like to second what he just said and being uh, um, in support of the motion as it exists with the language that you added at the end. And you added that at the beginning, so I don't have, so I, that language was right there, right? <laughs> yes. Correct. For Linda and Peter, so Correct. just don't want to change, I just need to know what I change. Can you just, all of this discussion has got me thinking about how the term negatively impact our budget could be interpreted. So can you reread that? Sure. The whole thing or just the last? <laughs> just the <laughs> last. The last. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. While recognizing the desire to enhance the function, functionality of Hannaford Field, 
The school board supports the proposal for bleachers. However, our primary responsibility is to provide the best possible educational services and programs to our students. Should the town's support of the project negatively impact the financial support of the school district, our support for the bleachers will be rescinded. So how do we define that? I mean, if we can't suggest to the town council how they fund it, we would like it to be funded via bond rather than come out of our operating cash flow, so to speak. Mm -hmm. However, even bonding it, you can only bond so much. So one could argue that the more we bond in the debt ratings and everything else does eventually negatively impact. Is that language clear enough? All of these conversations has, have got me mm -hmm. thinking about your comment. I mean, I think we should, the more you bond, it is going to impact us. So I think having a discussion of size, and so even if it is $35,000, that's Not even 35, still, it's 17000 Yes, with half of that. 17000 is fundraised. And I would argue that I think, while it was, it's a great thing, fundraising for the field has had a ripple effect on other fundraising in the community. I mean, I think for the parents' associations, we've seen that. I can attest to one that I'm directly involved in. Interesting. And we've heard what our parents' association can do for the Japan. So while it's only 17000 for fundraising, mm -hmm. that's a lot of money when you're out selling Sally Foster gift wrap, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just as an example. So I think there are, I don't think anything is just $17,000 when we're talking about that. That aside, I don't have a strong preference, actually, the more I talk to you guys, one way or the other, in terms of size. But now I'm concerned, and I support the motion, but now I'm concerned, the more I've just sat here for the past few minutes, wondering if that language could be misinterpreted. I am more than, more than happy if you have some recommended amendments. I'm not sure I do, <laughs> but I was just <laughs> mulling it over when all these points are being made, and I think they're very valid. And, and I Madam Chair. Yes. Excuse yes. me, let me go right ahead and finish, please. I was just going to say, my original thought behind this had more to do with the, the upcoming budget season, which we're about to mm -hmm. face. Um, I was looking more for a dollar for dollar type of investment um, coming out of our school budget in some way to make up for the cost of the bleachers. That was my intent in, uh, in the verbiage that, that was put here. But. I do see your point. Which and please, I know you work very hard, and I don't mean to undercut oh, no, no. that. I'm just thinking no, no. all these discussions might prompt. No. Yeah. Madam Jack? Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. Peter was first. Yeah. Trish, I don't think we can answer your question. I'd like to, and Linda and I have discussed it, but we haven't figured out how to do it yet. One of the concerns we had, if we go back to the original turf field and the concerns that Kevin had, our former member of this board, and he constantly went back to this. As we were promised that that turf field would not cost the school one cent or the town. And in the end, there were a lot of miscellaneous things that came in, lots of surprises at the end. And that's one of the reasons why we worded the motion this way is, if that happens, it's not part of the school budget. We're not paying for police officers and portable toilets and field goals and lights and anything else and site supervisors and all the other and the fence that came around at the very last. That's why we wrote that. And, at this point, it's, it's the best we could do. We had numerous moments of discussion about this, and we, we tried as best we can just to protect the integrity of the school budget. I, and I, may. I appreciate yeah. that. I please don't. And I'd love to do more, right. but I, I, I don't know how to word it. <coughs> Kathy, I think I may. Maybe um, Jack was next, yes, and then you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, the reason, you know, I, I appreciate the wording. But I, I share Trisha's concerns that the well only has so much water in it. Okay? You take out so much for schools, so much for town operations, so much for bonds. You know, if you increase one amount, then it decreases what's available for the other amounts. And so, you know, I don't know how you work that language to be better than you've made it, but I, my bottom line concern is that whatever we pay for bleaches somehow will impact the operations budget of the schools. Mm -hmm. And, and we're in a situation right now, we're facing a recession in this country, we're facing diminishing funding from the state, for school budgets, 
And I'm, I'm really concerned about the threat to the school budget, the additional threat posed perhaps by this. And I, I, I go back to what Peter said. Originally, there were some assurances from the committee that this was all going to be raised by citizen funding and there weren't any requirements for the town to come forth with funding. So it's a tough decision. I, I appreciate your efforts to put some good language in there, but I don't know what the effect of it will be. Rebecca? Um, I'm comfortable with the language as written by Linda and Peter, um, and mainly because uh, after our meeting last night and other conversations that I have had with some town councilors, there is a um, real effort afoot for the two bo bodies to work together. And in fact, um, Jim Rowe is in the process of organizing a meeting between some uh, town council members and school board members to just begun, begin discussing issues around budget. Um, not with any dollar figures, so we don't get caught up in, in fixating on actual percent numbers and things like that, but just to talk about issues. And I think that this is a perfect example of what will be brought up in that meeting. So as a board, we can say we do support bleachers, um, but we, you know, in this conversation, say we also recognize that there are some serious pressures being placed on this town, and how are we as the legislative body, legislative bodies, that's a little grandiose, um, as elected officials in, town, in the town of Cape Elizabeth, are we going to work together to try to come up with the best answer in the situation that we have? So, Linda and Peter, I th I'm comfortable with that, um, and I think um, the town council will hear the intent of what that language is and be willing to be responsive and take that into consideration. So, I support your motion. Additional discussion? Okay. I would just, the conversation is done from... <clears throat> item number one of the motion down to item number four of the motion. <laughs> Just want to get a sense, are we, do we feel comfortable with the proposal of the larger seating capacity? Initially, I was getting the impression that no. Um, now, I'm not too sure. Trish? I would prefer the smaller size. Given all of this, I would prefer the smaller size. Um, the money is a consideration, but the aesthetics. Um, I was at a game in Yarmouth. I can find this Yarmouth that had 800 people, and I know that their placement of their bleachers was not ideal, but it was huge. There was like 30 of us there for a regular field hockey game, and it was huge. And so, I mean, if you said 500, I'd probably say, yeah, okay. But um, so I'm more comfortable in recommending 1,000 or 996 <coughs> or whatever, 1,000, give or take. Um, and I'm not as comfortable with the 1,500 because forgetting the money, and I don't really forget the money, but that's a big, big, in my mind, in a huge amount of seats. And, and I think about what are the normal games? Is it going to cover a football game? No. Is it going to cover <coughs> the, as I've heard it put, the Christmas and Easter group? No. Um, but I also bring my own chair and my own blanket and all those things, and I is it terrific? No. Do I want it to be that way? No, but, um, but that's okay. So I guess I'm more comfortable with the thousand in answer to your question. Should we each express our? Sure. <laughs> um, I'm actually, I'm comfortable with, with the original motion as presented. Um, and given sort of writing on the tail of what Rebecca just said, sort of having faith in how I believe we are going to uh, be working going forward with the town council given this very um, challenging budgetary time that we're in, that 
those if it needs to decrease to be sensitive to not um, taking too much out of that well that we'll be working together to uh, that will naturally follow as a result so I guess I might have a little more faith in the process maybe naturally going there but not necessarily at this point in time restricting it to a smaller size so I'm very comfortable mm -hmm. with the motion as is Jack? You and Trish convinced me. I'm, I'm supportive of the proposal for a smaller. I think Trish's point about the fundraising impact that even $17,000 has um, is, a, is a valid concern and enough of a concern to sway me. Others? I'll let you Linda be last to be the swing vote. Chief, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. The difficulties we're having as a school board with things like school consolidation and the fear we have as to what's going to happen with school funding from the state is also true of the municipal side of the budget. What we used to call municipal revenue sharing, municipal revenue sharing is in doubt. Uh, there are many programs that are in the past have been shared costs with municipalities in the state. Those are all being challenged simply because the state is trying to find over a hundred million dollars to balance its budget, which they're required to do by law. So the municipal side of the budget is also going to be challenged as much as our side of the budget is being challenged. And that is the reason why I would like to make a statement to the townspeople that elected all of us that we understand that and Rebecca's comment and others that we're just concerned as to where all the money's coming from in the end for the entire town of Cape Elizabeth budget, both municipal and school. And I know both sides of the budget are going to be challenged this coming year because of actions by the state government because of their own revenue shortfalls. And we're going to have revenue shortfalls as well. I mean, there's legislation being proposed in this emergency session which is going to reduce the excise tax on automobiles, which is a big revenue producer for the state of, for the state of Maine and every municipality in it. Uh, I know sales tax revenue is definitely down because it's gauged by one large item, and that's automobile sales, and that industry in the state of Maine is tanked. So there's going to be challenges on the municipal side of the budget, and I think it's wise for the school board to do as much as we can to help each other out on this matter. So because of what's happening and not because of my own personal feeling as to which bleacher would be better I am going to support a motion to go for the small bleacher in the 996 person range it also makes fundraising a little more realistic because it lowers the impact on that as well no longer a swing vote. Right. I'm hearing from f four individuals that they're leaning towards the smaller. Linda, you made a motion. Do you wish to amend it? Well, based on the discussion, this most recent discussion regarding numbers, um, I believe I would like to amend my original motion and specifically just relative to the seating capacity of possibly lowering it from approximately the four, four, four 1,431 down to approximately 1,000 seats. Okay. With adjustments to the costs accordingly. Is there a second for that amendment? Second, please. Peter. Further discussion? So she amended it so we don't have to vote on the first one? That's correct. correct. She amended her vote because she's the only one that could amend it. Okay. How many games do we go above a thousand, roughly? It's right. Almost every football game. Here we go. Almost every Last year there were six. The average attendance at the football games was what? They're estimating right around, right around a thousand, eleven hundred. A thousand to eleven hundred. Mm -hmm. And these were only night games. Yeah. And that was with no sta with no seating. And that doesn't mean there were a thousand people there all at the same time. I have to interject yeah. just because this is my nerdy math sign. If you take the average of all of these football tennis games, it looks like more like the average is way, right up at 1,500. So, for the football games, because you have 1,300, 1,200, 1,400, 800, 3,000, 2,000, 4,000. Yeah, these were 2,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Those are the Mountain Valley games. The Mountain yeah, the Valley playoffs. games, 1,300, 1,200, 1,400. Those are what I would call the Easter and Christmas games. I would probably add to that, though, it's a, fair, a little bit of community pride, too. Mm -hmm. So 
I don't think I'd want to discount the excitement that comes with those games. Yeah. Oh, no, they were pretty exciting. They were. Right. Very exciting. And if you're tall, you can see them better, right, That's right. Alan? Stand in the right place. Um, can I have permission to speak to this for a moment? Oh, absolutely. As well, uh, I'm not a voting member, uh, so I'm just just to give you some information uh, where I'm where my thinking comes from is that I look at this as a 30-year investment. This is not just a one-year investment. It looks at a long period of time. My sense is we have talked consistently as we've gone through this process this year. This year was a practice time. What we saw this year is a beginning step, not an ending step. I think the numbers are going to increase considerably as time goes on. Uh, I understand the concerns about what will happen to uh, the budget or any budget. I understand the concerns about we have ordered uh, 40 classrooms full of, for, of desks for the, for the schools. Uh, I understand we have ordered a lot of emergency equipment for the schools through this bonding issue. Uh, I, I strongly feel, and I'm not a voting member of this, and so I just need to put my feelings on the table, I strongly support the 1,500 seats. I strongly support that plan because I think if you do the math and you look at it carefully, in the long run, we are spending money wisely at that point in time. <laughs> I understand that we are running into many financial problems, but if you, you talk about my baseline, my baseline is what are we doing for students? And I think for students, we have, we have given them a field, which they're very proud of. I think we give them the seating, which they will, be, will add to that pride. I think that's a really an important piece to look at. And so if, if we want to look at just one year and what it could cause, that's one argument. If we want to look at 30 years and of the field and the bleachers and what it will add up to, uh, I, would, I would go back if I were voting with you, and I'm not. And so I'm just putting my feelings on the table. I, would, I, I am very much in favor of the original plan, which is the 1,500 seats and moving ahead from there with the understanding, and I think uh, Rebecca said it very well, that it becomes a decision-making process with the town council and the school board at that point in time based on our finances and that big picture. And it does offer us a chance to work together carefully in order to make this happen. Again, that is my opinion. I'm not a voting member. You are the voting members. But I, I, I had planned to stay very quiet during this, but I felt I just need to say what, what I'm feeling in this process. And I do know you have somebody in the audience who would like to speak, too, if you'd like to have him speak as well. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Yeah, please. I'm, uh, I'm Bill Homa. And I, have, I guess I have my fingerprints all over this field for lots of reasons. I was, I'm, uh, I'm senior vice president at Hannaford, and I was the guy that really figured out that this field was on the original site of Hannaford Brothers Farm. And I took that proposal to Hannaford, and I asked them to donate the money in, mem in memory, really, of the original Hannaford Brothers that started their farm on that site. And Hannaford did donate that money, which kind of kick-started the whole process which got it going. As part of that, I feel a responsibility to make sure that the field is finished. And I, my fingerprints are all over this field because I got the goalpost and I got Coke to donate the scoreboard and I had it installed. And I had the lacrosse boosters donate the safety nets and I had those installed. Um, and I was the guy that did the lines. I designed the lines for the field, um, which I'm very proud of because I think it's the most, the most innovative and playable lines of any um, artificial turf in the country. I mean, we really did a lot of research and it's really a strong design. So I, I did all of that mostly because I'm motivated because my company's name is on the scoreboard and I feel like I need to be, pr you know, I live in the town but I want to be proud of what is there. So, and I, want, and I, I pass it every day and I want to make sure that <clears throat> there's a lot of other people from Hanford that live in town and I want to make sure that when I see them in the cafeteria in the morning that everybody's, you know, everybody says that this is, this is a a class um, project, and it is. It came out terrifically. The irony for me is we have, the, I think, the best field, artificial field or otherwise, of any school or college in the state. We have the worst facilities of any school in the state outside the field. <clears throat> we have no bathrooms. We have no concession stands. Um, 
I mean, it's really, uh, and, and the bleachers. So we have, I mean, the, the, the juxtaposition of having this wonderful field and people sitting in mud and having to use toilets, you know, uh, porta potties, and, and people having to roll out grills to get hampers is, is it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. And the, <clears throat> I don't know how many people from Mountain Valley came up to me during the game and said, you have this beautiful field and you're a rich town, can't you afford a place to sit? I mean, I mean we can't for some reason. So I, I'm kind of, I, I used all my energy to get the field to where it was, and I'm very proud of what we did. And by the way, I'm only speaking personally. Of me. <clears throat> I'm not representing Hannaford. Or, I'm also on the football boosters. I'm on the state cross boosters. And I'm on kids' turf, but I'm not representing. I'm just representing myself. In this. Um, I'm proud of what we did. I think it's, I, I feel that the field is, is in excellent shape. I think we need bleachers. I think we need a concession stand. I think we need real bathrooms. To finish, to finish the job. <clears throat> We're not even talking about bleachers for visitors. On the visitor side, one of the few fields in the state that doesn't provide seats for visitors. And I can tell you what's going to happen <clears throat> if you put 900 seats on the, on the home side of the football field in Mountain Valley sends 1,000 people at 6 p.m. And this is what they did at Gorham, I mean at uh, Greeley last year. They filled up the Greeley home stands completely with Mountain Valley people. And when the Greeley people came in at, at game time, they had to go to the visitor side of the field and sit. It's like a, and there were, there were close to two or three, well, oh, I think there were over 3,000 people at the, at the first Mountain Valley game. So the irony is if you have nine, and my suggestion is if you only do 900 or 1,000 seats, don't do it at all. Because the, the worst mistake you can do is put something in that's too small and you're going to regret later that you can't expand it. So, I mean, it's, it, for a 30-year investment, it, kind of, it seems silly to me to make an investment that, that can't be added to. Um, I, think you need, I think you need to make an investment that, that you can be proud of in 30 years, and you won't look back in three years and say, geez, for $35,000, we could have added 500 seats. What, what the hell were we thinking? Why didn't we do that? Um, I think you have to do it. I think, I think uh, the town demands it. I think these... I think the first Mountain Valley game was an incredible community event. And I think there'll be two of those games a year. And it's not, it's not just Christmas or Easter, it'll be lacrosse. Because uh, I think now that lacrosse team doesn't have to play in mud every, you know, every game in April and May, we'll have state championship lacrosse teams again, and we'll get more than 1,000 people in the seats. So it'll be six or seven or eight or nine or 10 games a year, or 12 games a year. <clears throat> or maybe we'll have bleachers to the point where uh, we can rent out the field, and it'll be, uh, you know, a community, the Southern Maine Community College will come over and say, we'd like to rent your field because now you have bleachers, and I assume you'll have a concession stand, and you'll have real bathrooms at some point. <laughs> so I guess I, my point is, if you want to finish the project, do it the right way or don't do it at all. Do, I think 1500-1441 fits nicely between the 30-yard lines. I don't think it's obtrusive because of the hill. I think it's forward thinking, thinking that is the field is leveraged and being used more. <clears throat> the seats will be there. I think you'll get complaints from visitors that have to sit on, stand on the other side of the field in football games on a, on a very steep slope <clears throat> and say, you know, you, you have this nice field and you have the nice home bleachers and what about the visitors' bleachers? But that, that's kind of a future thing. But again, if you don't, if you don't provide bleachers on the other side of the field, all those fans will sit on this side, and, and that'll actually make the problem worse. So I suggest if you want to finish, move the project along in the way that's already been established, <coughs> is add, um, change, your, change your amendments and say, well, we want to support the 1,441 seats. <coughs> it provides a 30-year solution. It provides room for growth. Um, and we won't be second-guessed by the town in three years when we say, why do we, why do we spend $250,000 on seats that are inadequate? I, in, in my job, I, <coughs> I run systems for Hannaford. The last thing I want to do is, is buy a computer system that's going to be, that's going to be undersized in three months. So I always, I always buy something that, in anticipation of growth, and it's, and it's served Hannaford very well. Um, and, and this is a, a classic example of a long-term investment that you want to make sure that you invest the right funds in the right way um, for future growth. Thank you, Bill.
Pardon? Well, I was wondering if uh, Kirsten wanted to say something at her two cents. <laughs> I was torn for a while between um, 1,000 and 1,500, and um, I would have to agree with 1,500 because um, I do see growth happening, and I do feel that um, those seats will be used, especially in the bigger games like Mountain Valley. And um, I do feel we definitely do need bleachers, because I know that was a complaint by pretty much all the students, that we don't have a bleachers or a concession stand. And, yeah. <laughs> and the proposal is for bleachers. It is not for a concession stand at yeah. this point, correct? correct. It's not bleachers. For, not for um, bathroom facilities. Just bleachers. Just bleachers, OK. OK, now we have motion on the floor for 1,000 that we're discussing. Does anybody else want to say anything about that particular motion? A question. Yes, Trish. And actually, part of, to Bill and or the Hannaford Field Committee, we can't put visitor bleachers in because of the topography there. Is that correct? Uh, I don't know if it's been looked at. I think you could, in the future, you. I'm not expanding the project. I'm listening no, I'm to what saying. you're saying. I'm saying, I'm wondering if putting visitor bleachers in five years down the road, if we outgrow a stadium now of 900 seats, is the way to get to the expansion. And I appreciate everything you said, but unfortunately a school is not a for-profit business, and we don't always have the luxury of making the same type of analyses. No, but in my view, the, the Hannaford Field is an outside classroom, an outdoors classroom. Sports are an integral part of the education process, and providing a field of this, of this quality actually ex expands the, the playability of sports, and I think sports are an integral part of the education of, uh, of students. And anything you can do to, to support that, I think, supports the entire educational experience. So to say that sports is, is, is separate, I don't think makes sense. I, I th I really think if you're going to do 900 or 991 seats, I think you shouldn't do it. I think you should hold this and, and we'll stand for two or three more years and when finally when the town gets tired of doing that, we'll put in the seats that uh, will accommodate the crowds that we expect. Yeah, I think it would be a mistake to undersize something that's got a 30-year life. I, I just think it's a mistake. So we, can't, we couldn't look at visitor bleachers as a way to expand the seating capacity five years out? I think it's risky to think that because the visitor side is so close to the wetlands that you'd be able to stick something in there. Okay. I think it'd be incredibly risky. Okay, that's, so the answer is basically no. Probably no. Karen, you look like you're going to say <laughs> something. That someone will amend the motion. Well, I think that maybe Linda wants to know all right, so Where people are before she amends or doesn't amend. As you all know, as chair of the finance committee for the third year, I am all too aware of the kind of financial pressures that we face as a school district. And Trish, your point is exactly right about how we, are, we unfortunately cannot, func we do, we're not allowed the opportunity to make our decisions within the same scope as a for-profit organization. Um, I wish that we got as much vocal support um, for our educational budget that's paid by taxes as there is for people paying um, to support things by donation. For some reason, there's very interesting dynamic that happens where people are more than willing to give money to a project like this. But when you say you're going to pay more in taxes, people get a completely different, we get a completely different reaction. So I need you to understand, as the only public person here speaking in support of it, but, and hopefully there are other people listening, that's the basis, I think, for, my, for maybe a lot of kind of our resistances. Having said that, I do agree with the, the, the viewpoint of for $17,000, roughly, investment over a 30-year bond, um, it makes sense to me 
that we bring in bleachers that can accommodate the kind of crowds that we get on a regular basis for football games. And I would hope for girls field hockey games at some point, wouldn't that be nice? Um, but I just, I agree. I think it makes sense at, in this environment now. Having said that, we're going to have a whole nother round of discussions when it comes to budget and when it comes to talking to the town council in that meeting about the financial pressures. Our world and municipal government, it's ugly right now. We're getting hammered from all sides, as Peter so well put it. It's not just school budgets, also now municipal budgets, and they're trying to ta tax revenue sources for towns. It feels to many of us here that the concept of town and local control are really getting, it's trying to be eradicated by a certain um, population of our state leaders. So that, if we could take this project and remove it from all of those ugly realities of what's going on on our budget side, I think it would be a quick, easy vote. But this kind of hovers over us constantly. Um, so Linda, I support the original motion because I do think in the long run, we should do that right. Jeff? Uh, sorry. Yes, please. I think we can all use all the help we can get at this point. <laughs> um, I was not an athlete when I went to high school. I wish I were. I should have run cross country. Biggest mistake I ever made. <laughs> but I was in the marching band. And I got to play saxophone in the marching band. And I can remember sitting... Um, in the marching band, surrounded by people on bleachers um, in my high school in New Jersey. And I also happened to be, um, back when we were looking at the building renovation project, I was on the original renovation committee, and I think I was one among several people who made the point at the beginning to say that the, the field area that we have in the back of the school is absolutely beautiful in terms of its backdrop. And I think I had just recently been at a game in Greeley, I think it was a soccer game in Greeley, and was struck by the excitement um, of people going to the Greeley games and how it brought people together. Um, and it occurs to me, listening to Kirsten, I, I think she's absolutely correct. And I think she speaks for what most students would say were they here, which is that what's in the best interest of students, looking back on their high school education, Hopefully people remember a lot about their teachers. I think they internalize a lot of the experiences with teachers and it becomes sort of a, something that they're not even aware of. But I know that they remember, whether they're in a marching band or in a football game or whatever, sort of the days of the, when the community came together in support of something that was really exciting. Um, and I do think that one of the things that happens, the dynamic, having attended quite a few games, football, soccer. Um, I think one of the effects of not having the bleachers is it actually takes away a little bit of that kind of community excitement. I noticed that our fans, um, uh, many times the ad adults would be in one part of the field, the students would be in another part of the field. There wasn't, wasn't the same sense of cohesiveness that I think was part of the original vision of the renovation committee when we started to look at the possibility of really developing that backfield so it was a really quality way, um, which has been enhanced unbelievably by the addition of turf and lights, which was beyond what the renovation, fee, uh, renovation committee originally thought that we could do. Um, I think that, that, that what happens on the field is an integral part of kids' education. And I speak as, I hope, the educational leader of the high school. Um, I know that it will impact the memories that kids walk away from Cape Elizabeth High School with. I think that it, the addition of the bleachers will give a different feel to that community and bring, bring the community together in a more cohesive way. I think just that physical togetherness is important and is particularly important in those big gatherings. Um, as much as those were positive experiences, I think bringing the fans together physically on bleachers will have even more of an effect than sort of the amoeba thing that happens um, at the games as they happen because people were sort of dispersed all over the place. So I would support the, 
the uh, 1500. I, I, when I originally was talking with Keith Weatherby, uh, who's gone to a lot more games at our fields and other fields, uh, I was initially in favor of something that was even smaller than what we were originally talking about. But the more I listened, the more I've talked to Keith, the more I reflected on what the original purpose of that committee was and the dynamics of what's actually happened on that field when fans are together, I think it would be a mistake not to, not to go with a larger proposal. Thank you, Jeff. Anyone else? Linda, do you have a sense of where you want to go with your motion? <laughs> Home? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you want to hear? I guess I, guess I can't move for us to adjourn at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> well, after listening to a lot of this recent discussion, that has taken place. I mean, I honestly, I was kind of back and forth between the, uh, the 1,000 and 1,500 seats. Um, one of the biggest points that has struck me is that we are looking at a 20 to 30 year project here. We are not looking at an instantaneous. And, and I do have a feeling that there is going to be continued discussion, that um, the buck is not going to stop here as far as numbers are concerned. I do believe that we are literally the first step in the process to at least get the proposal moving forward to, um, to a stage where some exact numbers will be put on the table. Um, based on that, I think I will withdraw my amended motion and go back to my original motion. So you're amending your amended? No, I withdrew my amendment. Okay. <laughs> to make it easier for you, Kathy, I'll withdraw my second part of the amended motion. Thank you, Peter. Just go back to the original motion and see what the vote is. Okay. So the you don't have to re-read it, but oh, good. Re <laughs> but the original um, proposal was for 1431. 31. Okay. Estimated by the Hanford Field Committee. Does anybody have any clarifying questions? Does anybody have an additional discussion, things that they'd like to say, bring forward? I, I feel like. Yes, Jack? I'm very much a follower in this discussion, I'm not a leader at all. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all feeling like followers. I'm being swayed in both directions, very effectively, I might say, too. Um, I'd like to say to Bill, I mean, Hannaford Field is a tremendous addition to the town, to the school system and all that, and I, it's just magnificent. So uh, the fact that we are debating the size of leeches doesn't take away from the gratitude that I think the town feels towards Hannaford, to you personally, and to the citizens that raise the money for the field. Um, but we are custodians of the town's tax money and custodians of the educational mission for the, the town. And that's what's playing into this, too. Um, I will say that I am now influenced by both Alan and Jeff taking a position in support of it. Um, but I still worry a great deal about where we are financially. I wish that the citizens group had been able to do a more complete job of private fundraising for this. Um, so there wouldn't, it's the question of town funding wouldn't exist at all. Um, I will defer to Jeff's judgment on this. Um, I respect Jeff greatly as an educator. And I respect the kind of consideration he brings to difficult decisions. And um, I will support the larger number of seats in support of Jeff's recommendation. Anything else? Okay. All in favor of the proposal that includes seats of 1431. Peter, are you in favor of that? You are not in favor of the 1431. Okay. All opposed? Six to one. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
11 D action on Chinese program well, initially when we put this on here we were considering asking for a vote to go forward with an application against each program. Um, but I feel that just put together this committee to examine the planning and so forth and that we delay any vote until the committee's had a chance to do its work. Okay. So we'll be taking no action. Okay. Um, 11E, athletic position, Alan? Yes. I have uh, two here. Uh, first one that I have is uh, from, bear with me for just a minute, it's been so long I forgot. It's from the high school. And this is only a revision, so I'm not passing anything out to you. Uh, in uh, two mo a month ago, uh, you voted on two assistant boys ice hockey coaches, and they would split the $3,510. Uh, that has now changed, and so there will be only one assistant coach. And so that, that $3,510 will go to that one coach who is Curtis Brown. And so this is just really an informational piece, just to let you know that that has changed if you if you follow your minutes, and I would be happy to try to answer any questions. And, and so then I do have one for action, which I will pass to you. The second one is from Scott Labby at the middle school. Uh, this is for a new coaching nomination. This is for Darcy Holland to be the girls' expansion basketball coach, 120 hours at level two, and explains that Darcy is an excellent coach in our district. She has basketball knowledge as a player and comes highly recommended. She will be a great addition to the girls' program. And you see on the back uh, the summary of uh, the recommendation, the reason for the recommendation. And I know I'm going to be completely confused, but is she no longer the field hockey coach? Different, different seasons. Different seasons. Thank you. You can see that I'm really bright on these hold uh, athletic things. Was this budgeted? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Is there a motion? I move that we accept the superintendent's nomination for uh, the girls' expansion basketball coach as presented. Second. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Linda. Any discussion? Questions? All in favor? 7 0. Another one? Oh, that's it. Yeah, that's it? That's okay. Um, okay. So going to committee reports, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to do what I did last month in that if there's a committee chair that feels that it's important to say something specific about their committee, um, please let me know. Otherwise, we will assume that the notes on the website, which are there, available to everyone, uh, will suffice. Uh, Linda? I would... Uh more or less just like to make a, re or a request for the <coughs> committee that you've all received um, your self-evaluation forms. We do have our retreat coming up and as requested uh, if you could fill them out and bring them with you because I believe there's a lot of pertinent questions there that will help us to organize our thoughts around discussions during the retreat. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, and thank you for working on putting that together. I know you get a lot of feedback from people and reorganized it several times. Does everybody have their emailed version? Okay, great. Any other committees? That, yeah, Trish? Um, actually, a subcommittee of the policy committee, which is a calendar committee. Um, the minutes are on the website, but I want to take a ch the opportunity to thank people who had completed the survey that we did. Um, we're, we'd like to continue to engage the public in discussion on the calendar as some of the proposed changes that we're looking at and for some of the years subsequent to this might be more drastic, if you will. Um, but there, I guess I want to put it in the context that we're looking at some of these changes 
because of the changing educational landscape, um, the need for additional instruction time, their cost considerations. So those are some of the things. That's what's driving the calendar changes and why we would really like to solicit people's feedback. And I would like um, to just comment one observation that was made that did not get into the minutes, that during the calendar committee meetings, it, it becomes very obvious that meeting the needs of the three different schools is a challenge. There are very different needs from a calendar perspective and other perspectives as well at Pond Cove as in the high school and the middle school is sort of in, in the middle. Um, so we will do the best we can and hopefully generate a, produce a calendar that meets most of the needs of all of the schools to the best of our ability. Thank you, Trish. Other committee reports needed? No? Okay. Um, public comment on agenda items, which I think we've already heard, unless there's anybody else. No? Okay. School board agenda requests. Anybody have requests for next month? Announcement of upcoming meetings. I'll do that just because there's a few that are different. Um, the calendar committee next meets, uh, Trish, when? Janu Thursday, January 31st. 31st at 3 p.m. in the middle school conference room. Yep. Finance committee is Wednesday, January 23rd at 8 a.m. in the superintendent's office. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yes? Yes. I don't know when the next school board meeting is. Next month about this time? It's February 12th. <laughs> Thank you. February 12th. Um, Wellness Committee next February 4th. February 4th at 310 in the fire station meeting room. Communication Committee is Thursday, January 10th at 3 p.m. in the Pond Cove Media Center. Personnel Committee is Friday, January 10th. It, tomorrow. Oh, okay, that can't be the same day. There we go. Thursday, January 10th at 8 a.m. in the Jordan Conference Room. School board workshop is Tuesday, January 22nd at 7 p.m. in the high school library. Extracurricular met today, so their next meeting February is... February 5th. February 5th. <laughs> um, 3.30. 3.30 in the Jordan Conference Room. Policy committee is Tuesday, January 15th, 12 noon in the Jordan Conference Room. Sports done right Monday, January 28th at 7 p.m. in the community center. Yeah has been changed to the high school library. Okay. Monday, January 28th, 7 p.m. high school library. And there was a school board retreat this Friday, January 11th, from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the SMCC McKernan Center. Can I just go back to the personnel committee just in case I didn't hear that? Correct. that tomorrow, right? Tomorrow. So it's Wednesday, January 9th. Correct. Okay. Oh. Or both a day in. It's the not day Thursday, tomorrow? January 10th. Yeah. Tomorrow. It's tomorrow. I'm sorry. Wow. Wednesday, January 9th. I still got it wrong. Uh, yes. It says Friday, but, but really Wednesday. It should be, it should be Wednesday the 9th. Okay. Wednesday the 9th. Tomorrow. Yep. Okay. At 8 o'clock. Okay. And the Jordan Conference Room. Yes. yes. Jack? Do we have a strategic planning committee meeting this month? We, yeah, we, I'm do, gonna, we don't yet. I have we will. But we will probably in early February. There's no meeting scheduled yet. We're sort of waiting. I had a meeting today, and I haven't even had a chance. We have to okay. okay. What we, need to we don't typically meet every month in strategic. I didn't meeting. know that. Okay. Anybody else? I'm Is there a Thank you, Linda. Is there a second? Second. Rebecca. Yes. Thought nobody else wanted to adjourn. Yeah. Any discussion? No.